Before you start, Jerry, I have a plaque here from LACON 2 commemorating your uh, good services as Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. We have, in theory, three speeches, one of them mine, but I won't give one. I, I get plenty of places to publish that sort of nonsense, and I get paid to do it, and here I don't. I give you the fan guest of honor, Richard Eaney. Probably nine-tenths of you haven't the slightest idea who I am, and you're quite right. I'm Dick Eaney, and although I was active in fandom for many years, I was mostly active in fanzine fandom. I have, I think, the credit, if credit is the right word there, of publishing the first fanzines ever put out in Vietnam, Kenya, Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Tanzania, and unless our Japanese colleagues were active before 1945, probably mainland China. My major publications were Fancyclopedia II, which you can read about in your convention book, and, and A Sense of FAPA, an anthology for the 100th FAPA mailing, which I think is still the bulkiest single issue of a fanzine ever. It had some other good qualities too, but by the time I'd finished collating the last page, that was the one that impressed me most. The main reason most of you have never heard of me is that back in 1964, I was hired by the Agency for International Development, which is the outfit that handles our foreign assistance program. And since then, I've served about half the time in Southeast Asia, mostly Vietnam during the war, and half in East Africa. I found fairly soon that full-time work in a job that requires commitment rather than time-filling played hell with my FANAC. And although I managed to keep up some publishing while I was in Southeast Asia, as Jerry mentioned, I haven't been really active since about 1975. Despite inactivity, I still read science fiction and fantasy with more pleasure than almost anything except history, and I still feel an affection for my fellow fans. I suppose, really, I'm the fanish equivalent of undead. And, I, and that's why I want to hold forth for a while on the question, is there life after fandom? I still have a lot of fanish contacts, mind you, and I keep telling myself I'm going to become active in fandom again after this world revolution thing blows over. And it's not as if fanish things don't keep happening to me just when I think I'm safely, if depressingly, involved in the mundane world. Back on the Earth plane, I'm what the State Department calls a desk officer. That is a sort of long-distance executive secretary for the uh, USAID mission in my country. You may visualize it if you think of me as the person who gets yelled at to do something when matters don't fall clearly under the jurisdiction of sp some specialized office. That has in itself occasionally had what the bibliophiles used to call fantasy elements. Would you, would you believe, for instance, having to argue with a managerial type but all that was needed to convert incidents per thousand into percent was to shift the decimal one place to the left? Would you believe losing the argument and having to send the tables back to be recomputed? Most of my job, let me admit once for all, if not that silly, is at least as repetitious and dull as bureaucratic jobs are supposed to be. And finding fanish incidents cropping up in it suggests that they're not as rare in the real world as we sometimes like to think. Since I've been working with parts of the third world all this time, on the other hand, I have gotten into some situations that had real fantasy themes. I can think offhand of the time we were doing a field check on East Coast fever among the Maasai cattle herds, which involves doing a blood smear for microscopic analysis. Now, cows don't have a high opinion of people who stick needles in their ears, so they have to be pinned down first. And the Maasai, who are mostly pretty skinny, were doing this by sneaking up behind them, grabbing one hind foot and holding on while the cow kicked madly until it lost its balance and fell, after which it usually lay there looking indignant while they bled it. Well, I thought I knew a better trick than that. 
considering that I weigh about 100 pounds more than most of the Maasai, so I tried to uh, cowboy style. Strolled up beside the cow, reached under, grabbed the two off legs and yanked. It worked fine. The cow, which had obviously never had anything like this happen before, sort of lay there goggling at me while my companion uh, lanced its ear. When it started to wiggle, I patted its shoulder and talked to it reassuringly while, and it uh, quieted down. Uh, this, this trick worked on children when I was a medical laboratory technician, and I figured, <laughs> and I figured it ought to work on other marginal, marginally intelligent life forms. Actually, they get it from voice, tone, and body language, but uh, why be realistic? After a few repetitions, we got this procedure down pat and were collecting blood smears at a great rate while the other technicians and their Maasai bulldoggers were having to fight for every drop of blood. Well, nomads don't enjoy foreigners giving them points in what they consider their own specialty, so I wasn't too surprised to get some funny looks from the Maasai after this. But I didn't realize that it might be a case of uh, culture conflict until the head of the project called me in and asked me what the hell I had done to the cattle. I explain. You were talking to them, he says. Just what did you say? <laughs> well, it had been something on the order of, good bossy, who's a nice little scruffy flea-bitten longhorn cow then? And I hoped I hadn't put the Maasai's backs up. No, he said, that isn't the problem. Good bossy. Uh, never mind the details right now, Dick, but if you notice the Maasai bringing a witch doctor into camp, I want you to come straight back here to the office. Don't wait around to see what he's there for, understand? This is a key problem for people in my line of work. The clash of traditional beliefs with modernity, not that they necessarily do, but that uh, traditional values are based on the traditional pattern of abundance and scarcity, and the fact of a change in the pattern of abundance, or even quite modest changes in what is abundant or scarce, uh, forces a change in practice that almost always creates some kind of friction. Now, since fans and fan types are conscious of this process, we do have advantages in dealing with the problems it raises. For instance, the time we found that an uh, actually ineffective but uh, very well conceptualized traditional medicine was stalling an effort we were uh, making to stop a local epidemic. You say that people don't trust these funny-looking pills the round eyes want them to take. You say they think they need powdered tiger bone to restore their yang energy balance. Tell you what I'm going to do. I have here some homogenized powdered tiger bone. Now, with bat sweat added, just try it for three days, only three days, and you won't believe what it'll do for your vital forces. And it worked, too. It, it should have worked. It was 50-50 triple sulfa and chloromycetin. And dealing with the kind of problems that hit people in the third world does sort of fine tune your capacity for indignation. If you're used to thinking of hatred and loathing as the way you feel toward Ted White for pirating your pen name, it's definitely a mind expanding experience to be picking yourself up and starting to give first aid to an innocent bystander while you hope the police get there fast and also hope that the local medic wasn't doing her weekly shopping when the marketplace got bombed. Things like this, of course, differ so much in degree as to differ in kind from the evils we're used to finding in fandom. The most disgusting thing I've heard of allegedly happening among Stefanists in the last couple of years is a BNF supposedly going on the take and trying to set up an L. Ron Hubbard fandom despite knowing who and what L. Ron Hubbard was. This is, uh, this is not in the same league with, say, the government of Ethiopia, which responded to the severe drought in their provinces of Eritrea and Tigray by launching a military offensive in the hope of crushing the uh, separatist guerrillas there while they were immobilized by the crop failure. 
You've maybe read about the several million people endangered by starvation in Ethiopia, but you might not have been told that most of them are not getting any of the relief supplies that the free world donor nations have been sending in because the Ethiopian army is in the way. All they're getting is the dribbles that can be smuggled across the borders from neighboring countries by the guerrilla's own relief agencies who have to do their work in the teeth of MiG and Sukhoi strike aircraft and helicopter gunships. If I'd only asked, maybe they could have given us some hints for getting party supplies into the Khan Hotel. Oh well, too late to think about that now. This sort of thing is a manifestation of the zealots' conscious mindset. The antithesis of the cynical, of the cynical skepticism of which fan, fanishness is uh, one aspect. It must not be mistaken for the simple errors of fuzzy thinking I was trying to make you laugh at earlier. These are not intentional. They happen only because nobody can think straight on an empty stomach, and a hell of a lot of people can't do it on a full one. They're a problem, but not an evil. The evil is the increasing legitimation of fanatics who lack the healthier form of cynical skepticism that we cultivate, or, or utilize it uh, merely as a gambit to attack their opponents. People who regard consideration of scientific evidence as a sort of adversary proceeding like a court trial. Facts have a tendency to get in the way of political theses, and those who seek influence among true believers have done their damnedest to induce or hypostasize shifts in scientific thought and the suppression of the standards that can distinguish legitimate scientific theories from their abuses and perversions. For this sort of thing, the slightly pixie attitude, which we usually call fanishness, is one of the natural antidotes. The skeptical and cynical mindset, rather than a purely contradictory rigidity, is the true antithesis to fanaticism. I'm not using cynical in its invidious sense here, although the attitude I'm describing has shortcomings I'm not mentioning. Cynics are often tolerant in a way true believers consider horrifying. Certainly we aren't backward about asserting our opinions, but just stop and consider whether Aside from a handful of ideologues in New York and Berkeley, you can really think of a fan who would kill somebody for professing even the most wrong-headed belief. Fanish types are even capable of being generous-spirited, uh, as long as they can set up an explanation that makes it seem that they're really acting from selfish motives. Now, now I can perceive the psychic vibrations all over the hall flowing as we look around at our fellow fans and think to ourselves, if these people are the solutions, our problems are worse than anyone imagined. <laughs> so they are. The world continues to be confronted by immense and intractable problems, which the fanatics find it convenient to blame on whoever they are currently promoting for the office of great Satan. That allotment of blame is not the interpretation that would be accepted by the kind of people I've been loosely calling fanish, but of whom I think by now you realize actual fans are only a fraction. Beyond us, the people who literally read SF and fantasy, it includes the scientists and engineers, and in a still wider sense, all of us who are moved by the secular and humane spirit. The people of whom Anatole Rappaport said, that when we think of problems, we tend to think of solutions. This is a habit we've acquired as participants in a technology-oriented civilization, the only kind that can now survive, let alone meet the needs of humanity. And for us, the greater the problems, the greater the, the possibility of getting the better of the ideological exploiters. This doesn't imply that we're somehow going to constitute a resistance, like the uh, Fanish underground in the old serial, The Death of Science Fiction. Uh, so direct a, confront a confrontational approach is the province of the zealots whose style is alien to us and would moreover imply a unity among us that is contrary to the skeptical nature and innate Fanish perversity. Besides, open conflict has a way of being messy, noisy, and dangerous to the environment. 
It is simply the fact not only of our existence, but of the steady increase everywhere in the numbers of intelligent, good-humored skeptics that gives me the most hope for a quiet old age indexing my fanzine collection and writing bawdy filk songs for Appa L. Simply, we and the people like us, people who have gone beyond the idea of official dogmas, can deal with the problems that come up in this world, this delightful, murderous, fruitful, and fragile world that is not only stranger than anyone imagines, but stranger than anyone can imagine. The true believers and their holy writ can't cut it. Trying, for instance, to deal with the crushing poverty of the third world by applying the principles of socialism has worked about as well as trying to deal with the energy crunch by applying the phlogiston theory. And here's the thought I want to leave you with. The old science fiction league was right. People like us can determine the future. We did it three centuries back when the war wars of religion were boiling, and we can save the world again. It's a weird job, but somebody needs to do it. And really, besides being a great ego trip, it's kind of fun. Thank you, Richard. Our guest of honor, Gordon R. Dixon. I can't see you at all because of the lights. Ah, but then it isn't necessary that I see you. Ah. I never write speeches. I don't write speeches because I like to... Uh, you, there's a curious thing about audiences. You can feel them. Hot, warm, cold. You've been in a swimming pool or in a, an open body of water where you suddenly go from cool water into warm water and so on and so forth. Well, after a while, when you're talking to an audience, you get to the point where you can feel that you're getting into cool water and you back off and go in a different direction. You can't do that, or at least I can't do that with a ready-made speech. If I lose the page I'm on, I'm lost. On the other hand, uh, I'm a little fuzzy because of this disability that uh, Jerry mentioned. And uh, I needed something to lead me through the jungle of my own talk. So I wondered what to talk to you about. Now I have, it's no, no lack of speeches, I have several hundred speeches I could give you. I want to do something different, so I decided to do, decided to do something I've never done before which is its talk essentially and quite selfishly about myself and my work. You know, it's a great temptation to sit here and tell you what a hard life I've had and what a long, heavy pull it was uphill to this moment. And I can't do it. <laughs> actually, actually, I've been very fortunate. My first stroke of fortune was having a mother who loved story and loved poetry. And my second stroke of fortune was having a father who was massively overqualified for his work during the 1930s depression. My father was literally a Victorian Englishman. That is, he was a schoolboy in England when Queen Victoria was on the throne. We belonged to his second family, his first wife having died some years earlier. Um, I was the oldest son. I was the only son at this time. And his, he was a mining engineer who had reached the point where what he did was manage mines that had five or 10,000 miners and associated other employees. And during the, that part of the 1930s, there just wasn't a lot of uh, openings for people like that. The mine he was in shut down because the price of coal dropped and what would nowadays be a coal corporation decided that it was losing money there. And so what for, about the first four years of my life he did was uh, keep us roofed and fed by consulting, which meant he was here, there, thither and yon, up beyond the Arctic Circle, various other places, looking at places, spots that could possibly be mined profitably. So I grew up essentially alone with my mother during these very early years, usually in some town where she and of course I knew nobody else. 
So I was in the ideal position any child is. I had my own adult to play with all day long. And as I say, she loves story and poetry. Not only that, she had a phenomenal memory, particularly for poetry. She knew uh, Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow's Hiawatha all the way through, for example, if any of you happen to know that. Uh, and she loved to recite these things to me. She could make up stories, she could tell me stories from memory, and she could read stories to me. So I can't remember a time when I wasn't immersed in story and poetry. And I also grew up with the notion that, uh, of course, I had, I had the very small child phenomenal memory for everything you hear and see. And judging by her, I simply assumed that if you heard something once, you should remember it. So most of the things she read to me or recited to me, I remembered in whole or in part. And when I was about four years old, I began to pretend I was reading. That is, I'd hold up a child's book. Others, probably a several number of you others have done this, held up a child's book and re recited from memory out loud what I had memorized, you know, uh, and went through the motions of turning the pages at the proper times and things like this. Well, you do this for a while, and pretty soon you begin to make connections between the, the word you're saying and the black marks on paper. So by the time I was through my fourth year, I was reading children's books. By the time I was six years old, I was trying to read everything in the house, skipping the hard parts, not understanding anywhere up to 90% of the parts I could read, but fascinated by it, absolutely fascinated. So when I was six years old, I told my father and my mother that I was going to be a writer. And neither one of them told me not to. Of course, they, I didn't, they may not have been sure that I would really take my work for life. Uh, thank you. That's uh, But you see, my mother would have been in favor of my being a writer in any case. And as far as my father was concerned, it was a respectable occupation. So I went ahead simply assuming I would be a writer. And by the time I was oh, 09 to 11, something in there, I was writing like a couple books. Uh, it's been so many, not nearly years, but decades since I saw the book of things that I can't remember <laughs> exactly how much they go. You, you know, these school notebooks uh, that are come, that are yellow paper with blue lines and they still have. Do they still have that? Yeah? Okay, well, they didn't want to talk, right? So I would write, fill these, turn one of these into a book, simply by writing a story down. And I did this actually uh, not with the idea of displaying it as a book, showing it to my mother, my father, or anything like that, but because it came closer to the magic of a real book. Do you, all of you, all of you even better readers out there, remember when you first got a real grasp on reading how magic books were, the heft of them, the smell of them, the feel of the pages and everything like that? Well, I could approach that simply by putting words on it. It was one step up from holding the child's book open and, and reading it out loud. So, I was putting these things together. Unfortunately, once I wrote them, they were no use to me anymore because I knew the story. And uh, one way or another that got lost, I, I don't have any today. I, I'd love to have one just to see what I was thinking at that time. Well, I went on still taking it for granted. Now, I didn't think I was going to be a writer, but taking it for granted. Uh, and by the time I, my father died, he came back to the United States uh, to my mother's family. And I ended the university of Minnesota when I was 15 and 19. By that time, I had a pretty good idea, very large, very fuzzy idea of what I wanted to write. But first, all I wanted to do was to see a book with my own name on the spine in a library. My God, that would be everything. And then, of course, I wanted several books with my name and then several shows, things like that. But it was a natural progression of this sort. But 
Somewhere along the line, I began to think of how, and it wasn't just any old book anymore. It had to be some special book. It had to be something that nobody had ever done before. And so I think I'm not paying any attention to what I wrote down after all. Uh, just let all that work. At any rate, I entered the University of Missouri, and I, I wavered between geology and English writing. Actually, you, you, at that time, at the University of Minnesota, you had a uh, major in uh, creative writing at the University of Minnesota. I, was in, I thought of geology because I was thinking instinctively of being a mining engineer. Some of my happiest times as a child had come up in the mines, summers, things like that. But, uh, our family was united. And on one of these survey camps where my father would be looking over a place to bring my mother and myself in. Um, so, the University of Minnesota didn't really want me, but since I was, because I was only 15, but since I was an accredited graduate of a state high school, but they were state universities, they didn't have any choice. But they insisted I take a week of testing, and they're testing you know. And in those days, I loved to take tests. Essay tests were to chance to fiddle around with words, and that was fun. And multiple choice tests was a guessing game which you tried to guess what the man who made up the test, or the woman who made up the test, wanted to answer. And I got to give credit. You know, look, there are unconscious patterns to these things. Well, anyway, I can't get off of that. So anyway, I came out of the anti score very badly as a potential geologist, and very excellently as a potential uh, <laughs> creative writing student. So I ended up being a creative writer. To this day, I'm the only author with 40 published books I know who has a creative writing degree. Creative writing degrees are much more common than they used to be for writers. It used to be to be a writer, we had to be a lumberjack, a deep sea diver, and do other things. <laughs> Nowadays, it used to be one with a, with a degree. <laughs> so, I am there with the idea of doing something different. And I had a more style and gradually this was all into it sort of crumbled under the pressure of several imperatives. For one thing I wanted these books to be read. And I came to the conclusion that what was needed was the clearest, simplest possible style. Not the most uh, beautiful wording or poetic or something like that. But my ideal was what I call the transparent style. You look through it as if looking through a plate of glass and the scene was actually beyond you. Um, the, really, this is what a book is. A book is a, is a do-it-yourself kit. The author sits down and measures and plans and cuts and delivers this bundle of potential story to the reader. And the reader takes that bundle of potential story and fits it back together again. But it's always a little bit different because he does it his own way, which is not the way the author would have done it. This book, I've just, uh, Barry, Jerry was good enough to mention, Final Encyclopedia. The lead character's name is Hal Main. Now, there will be in the imaginative universe, the universe of the imagination, as many Hal Mains as there are readers of that book. He's a boy in the beginning and he's a man at the end and they will see a different boy and a different man than I did. It will be a different man and boy that I saw, and it'll be a different man, a different boy than any other reader saw. This is because we put things together with the real elements of our own experience. This is one reason why teachers of writing, uh, sometimes not knowing what they're doing, but sometimes knowing anyhow, or stumbling across it, uh, or actually sometimes having worked it out for them, realize that the more you build with real bricks and mortar, the more you have a house that the harsh puffing of the critic can't blow down. You have something that the reader can live with. If you describe, for example, my friends, a, you need to, let's say you need to describe a valley. If you make up a valley out of your imagination, the best valley you can make up will not carry as much conviction to the reader as your remembering a valley you have seen 
and using that as the basis for your description. This is simply because the memory holds many more elements than the imagination will use. One of the tendencies when you first begin writing, something I went through myself, what helped to pull me out of it actually was about five uh, years of night school art that I took purely as a hobby, was the fact that if I wanted a character and a room, a chair and a sofa, that was all I had. There was a sort of a fog that you could see the character, you could see the chair, you could see the sofa, and there was a hint of walls around someplace. Nowadays, I'm not satisfied with that. I have to know right down to the doggone number of butts in the ashtray, what's in that room. It makes it more real to me. I'm right, going right back to where I sat at four years old and uh, made the book live by reciting the words out loud that I'd memorized. So, or making the copy book live by writing down in this, on this yellow paper with the lines on it. Well, all the way through the university, this idea was resolving and distilling and getting more precise. World War II came along and I lost about four years. I spent three years in uniform, never left the country, and I didn't do anything any more useful than a first-day janitor could do most of the time I was in there. Um, but that's the way it was. World War II was a, was a kind of a kind of a mess. The usual business, uh, the uh, the Cordon Bleu chefs were immediately set to uh, uh, I don't know building bridges, and the bridge builders were set to cooking dinners. Um, I came back and I could hardly wait to get back. Uh, see, I, was, I had enough credits for my degree, but I didn't have the degree, and I wanted to get back and get that degree and get busy writing. I'd, I'd lost all this lovely time. that I'd, I'd actually been ahead of the schedule up until that time. But I now do what I wanted, I thought. There was a bad disease going around after World War II called common sense. And that made all of us prize practicality. And for the first time in my life, instead of assuming that I would sit there all day and write, I thought, ah, I will go ahead and I will get my doctorate in English, and I will teach on the university level, and I will make the teaching pay for the writing. What could be smarter than this? So I went into graduate school, where I stayed for a couple of years, until I woke up to the ridiculousness of what I was doing. Because another thought occurred to me, which should have occurred five seconds afterwards, which is, why not make the writing pay for the writing? So I cut my only lifetime, my only source of sustenance, which was the GI Bill. And uh, I forget what it was then, but it was a lot of money. It was up to $69 a month or something like that. Anyway. Uh, and I dived into writing for the magazines. Now, unconsciously, although I didn't know it, I was very lucky in that all the play stories I'd read had given me an idea of structure. Basically, what non-do-it-yourself kilt kit makers in the writing field uh, don't know is structure. That's the, the, spy, the backbone skeleton of the story, which is the main thing. If you can do that, you can always turn out something that somebody will buy. During the Depression, when the pulp magazines were at their heydays, there were people who could do nothing but tell stories. There's a, uh, there are cultural characteristics in writing. The English, for example, uh, automatically write better characters than we do. They're much better on characters. They, as children, they tend to have imaginary playmates. You know, and, and they belong to little theater groups, and everybody acts, and so on and so forth, and they act in real life, too. Uh, we don't. Our newspapermen, or pardon me, our writers, uh, learn their trade for right down to the present, usually by being a newspaperman. Mark Twain was a newspaperman, you know, so on and so forth. Everybody took a stint at it. And in newspaper writing, they taught you to do the doggone bones of the thing. So I knew that I was able to get by, and I was getting roughly a penny a word. It ran as high as Astounding, which is now analog, was paying two cents a word, but at, uh, most of them were paying a cent a word or even a little bit less. And by God, I made a living at it. 
made a living at it. Uh, now, while I had been a graduate student, I had been assiduously at work on a novel in my spare time, the way I'd planned. I called it The Pikeman. I had settled on what I wanted to do. I wanted to write something I called the consciously thematic novel. And to this day, I blush at that doggone title. It says exactly what I mean to say, but it's a, it's a hideously clumsily way of describing the doggone thing. What I wanted to do was use theme as a story. Those of you who have read Wuthering Heights will remember uh, that the moor in there takes on the status of a character. The moor is, sits down at a table with the living human characters practically and eats breakfast and lunch with them. What I wanted to do is expand the function of theme in the same way. And I was fumbling toward this in my graduate years and I wanted to, I'd fallen in love with a particular type of character that I thought at that time was particular to the Renaissance. I found out later he was really a medieval type of character, particularly a late medieval type of character. If you had been in the 14th or 15th century, uh, somebody, I mean your, your present day self, but you're able to hop back in time. And having hopped back in time and finding yourself perfectly clothed uh, respectably as a rich Tuscan would be and speaking good Tuscan, you find yourself in the north of Italy in a city at the equivalent of a then cocktail party some afternoon and you find yourself talking, let's say, to some gentleman dressed as splendiferously as you are and to your astonishment you discover that aside from some ideas he has that you know better about because of course you come from the 20th century, that the man is remarkably well-informed and, relatively speaking, and sensitive and discerning on politics, on philosophy, on a number of things. And he strikes you as a very sensitive intellectual. And you're astonished. Good Lord, we haven't changed a bit, you say. However, the party drifts on, you two get separated. Later on, you see him leaving. And he goes out on the portico of the doggone uh, building you're in, calls up his retinue, or rather gathers his gang around him, because that's essentially what it was, which was men, armed men, horses for those who were entitled to ride, and dogs. They all mount up and start out of the square, which is in front of the thing, and on the way out, they pass a beggar dozing in a sunny angle of some wall, and your sensitive friend six the dogs on the beggar just for the fun of watching them tear him about. And the shock is that you have this extreme intellectual sensitivity matched with what you then realize is tr tremendous human insensitivity. Now nowadays, we literally call such a character psychotic. Somebody incapable of having a conscience literally has none there, does not respond. Empathy doesn't exist. And I was fascinated not only with this type of character, but with a society that would find a niche for him and not find him strange at all. So what I wanted to do was take a young man who was a levy from a Swiss village. He was essentially drafted by the important people in the village to be part of a contingent of pikemen which were essentially sold south into Italy to serve as mercenary soldiers and make money for the village or, or the canton, depending upon what time of history you're in. And they used to, I've forgotten the names, there's marvelous German names for the three lines of pikemen. These pikes were enormously long. I can't, again, with my fuzzy head right now, I can't tell you, pardon me? Much effects. Well, I, I was thinking about, are you talking about the pike or about the, uh, the individual names for the individual lines? Uh, well, at any rate, what I had in mind was uh, they had, there were individual names which may have been more or less slang terms for the individual lines. And the first one translated roughly to lots of luck fellows. And the second one translated to hang in there. 
you know. And the third one was, you lucky 20-year men. You know. All right, this was the kind of situation in which he would gradually work his way to the rear rank and safety and go back to, uh, to Switzerland. And in the process, uh, would have a chance to examine this particular type of character which were found commonly among the rich and powerful in Renaissance times in Italy. Okay, when I quit uh, schooling and went to writing full time, I put the thing aside because there was no way at a penny a word that I could see that I could have the time to, to do the kind of book that I wanted to do. And I didn't even approach a novel for about four or five years. And then I finally did some for short ones for Ace Double Books. And about 57, 58, I found myself going to work on a book which turned out to be Dorsi, which is the anchor book of this child cycle of mine. And it fascinated me. It, it had a pet idea of mine. I, uh, there's a book called Balerian by Raphael Sabatini that deals with a theorist cast among pragmatists, um, a convent-raised boy who has soaked himself in uh, reading all about warfare since Grecian times, finds himself mixed up with the mercenary soldiers of his day who learned their trade in the field, more or less. So I wanted to use that in a different context, and I did. I, out of it came Dorsai, and it ran away with me. And it wasn't until the following summer, in those summers, I always went to the Milford Science Fiction Conference, in spite of the fact it was right in the heart of the hay fever belt. And I knew that I was letting myself in for a week of solid asthma, which is what my particular disability is, as me sitting in this chair right now. And I went because I was so hungry to talk to other writers. God, you love to talk shop when you live and work all by yourself this way. So I would go year after year, and it wasn't until I hit there that it was beginning to filter in me, in on me, that Dorsai, which had been published, actually, uh, earlier that year, uh, was der der derived from the Pikeman and what I had done and what I was after. And I was right on the verge of being what I had been searching for all my life, the pattern I wanted, the, the kind of writing I wanted to do. And I, the first night I would sleep six hours, the next four and the next two, and then God knows I wouldn't sleep at all. At any rate, came the fourth or fifth night and I was out on my feet and I said, well, maybe I'll sleep through. You tell yourself this. Sure enough, half an hour later, I woke up, bowled upright, unable to breathe, unable to move, but with my mind going at 90 miles an hour because you, your body pumps it out adrenaline to try and fight this doggone thing. So I sat there with my mind racing, my body immobilized, and the whole pattern of what it was to be the child cycle came out. These doggone 12 books. Uh, they were six books originally. Supposed to be two historicals, two contemporary, and two science fiction. Doris I and the sequel. And within 24 hours, that devolved into uh, six back and six 12. Now there's three historical, three contemporary, and six future novels, with the pivot point being at the end of this century. And from then on, it began to refine. I knew what I was after. The whole set of books was to be tied together by a thematic story, and it was to grind an axe. Now, what had blessed me was science fiction, surprisingly. If you'd asked me during those first four or five years when I was making a penny a word and scrabbling from short story to novelette, if I was a science fiction writer, I would have said, no, no, I'm just doing this to keep body and soul together until I have time to do the real work I want to do. But I learned something from science fiction. Science fiction. To begin with, any category of literature, and really science fiction, in my opinion, is a literature to itself. It's not a genre. I mean, we won't get into that, because that, this is running long anyway. What science fiction, every 
type of story, and particularly every type of novel, every category, fits itself most nicely, can be used most well in certain ways. But there is a sort of physics to writing in that what you gain by going this way, you lose by not being able to go this way. See, there's, uh, to give you, uh, Henry James pointed out in his notebooks, and a man named Alan Tate spelled it out uh, even better afterwards, essentially refined it, but it's Henry James' idea. You take, take your points of view, first person point of view, I woke up, and a gun was pointed through the window at me. Okay. That's first person. You have the most authority with this point of view. The reason you have the most authority is because the reader is not listening to somebody else tell them about a gun being pointed through the window. The reader is seeing herself or himself with a gun pointed through the window at them. And you very seldom doubt yourself, so you've got a lot of authority. But you're limited as far as movement goes, because you can't see or hear anything that your character can't see or hear. You move to third person. You have less authority, because now the reader really is hearing the story told by another party, and has to make an effort to put themselves into it. But you have a lot more freedom, because you can hop from the point of view of this character to the point of view of that character. And you can say, while Jack was killing Jill in room A, you know, Tom was being strangled by Mary in room B, see? All right, now, third person omniscient, where you get into what your characters think, gives you the greatest freedom in the world. You can go anywhere, you can even tell what's going to happen, and our 20th century writing, particularly our mainstream writing, if you'll notice, has really experimented with this, with the idea of the greatest possible movement. But it has the least possible authority, because something inside the reader says, yeah, but I really can't read people's minds. Because the reader has to put himself or herself into the book for the book to become real. Remember that do-it-yourself kit that I was talking about before? Now, what triggered off Henry James, of course, was um, uh, Madame Bovary by Flaubert. Madame Bovary, uh, what Flaubert essentially has is the reader, he uses third person omniscient with the uh, reader essentially perched on the shoulder of the characters. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to describe in without going into another Blinken lecture. But essentially, he gets a little bit more of the authority and uh, retains some of the freedom. Now, he does this by making the reader make more of an effort, put herself or himself more into the book. All right, now, my consciously thematic novel is one in which I make the attempt to give the reader something they can put themselves more into, that they can get more out of. Now it happens. I said science fiction gave me a great deal. Science fiction is ideal for one form in particular, and that is the propagandistic novel. Brave New World, 1984 on down. We still have lots of propagandistic novels coming out now, and they work well because the form is suited for it. fantasy the same way. Although fantasy is really the father, or if not the grandfather or grandmother of science fiction. Anyway, propaganda, a propagandistic novel, however, has one drawback, and I've written two of them. One was Naked to the Stars, and the other was The Far Call. Uh, the Far Call is unabashed propaganda. It was my propaganda piece for the space program. Um, the trouble with a propagandistic novel is that it, or the propagandistic story, is that it says to the reader, here's a statement. You can accept it or reject it, but there it is. In other words, the reader can either say, boy, I agree with you, you know, and run up a flag, or the reader can say, what is this stuff that I am being shoved, this unmentionable stuff, and 
throw it into the nearest fireplace, if there's a fireplace handy that's lit. The consciously thematic novel, or what I wanted to do at any rate and call the consciously thematic, thematic novel, would, however, instead of forcing the reader to this choice, merely make the thematic element, what otherwise would be the propagandistic element, available. I should have said earlier that the prop a propagandistic novel is simply one that insists on its theme. By the, that's a bit of a broad statement, by the way, but I won't stop to defend it now. Um, in other words, the available argument will be there, but the reader can ignore it if they want to. I was determined that these books of mine, these books that I had dreamed of as a child, as finding on library shelves, I did that once, by the way. I did get back to one of the old libraries I'd been in as a kid and found some of my own books in the dog and thing. It was lovely. Um, this idea that these books would find a home in the libraries. And this is where you hear a lot of talk about classics, but here are real classics. Go to any library, find something that was written 50 or 100 years ago, preferably 100 years ago. You've got a classic because people are still reading it. That means the story is still alive today. The reader can put himself into it even though the people wear different clothes and literally almost speak a different language. So first, these things had to be readable as entertainments alone. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, good Lord. I am running too long. Uh, all right. The point is, eh, and I know how to handle this very well. I will simply turn to the last page of my speech. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I have got the nerve to do that. Uh, somebody suggested, in case you in the back didn't hear, somebody in the front suggested I read the whole thing. Uh, what I want to say is, is that my argument in the, in the child cycle is that we are in process of evolution right now, in the process of an ethical evolution, and I'm using a thousand years from the time of the Renaissance to 500 years in the future to prove it. And, um, so I'll read these, this last bit here. In every generation, there have been those things which seem so intolerable that the race cannot do otherwise under the pressure of them if they continue, and there seems no way of stopping them, but give in, collapse, die. But two or three generations later, those particular demons are all but forgotten and entirely new ones occupy the public conscience. Right now, for example, in spite of a clear awareness that our danger of nuclear destruction is later, greater than ever, we do not in truth see a general apprehension as large as that, as there was in the 1950s when every hamlet and suburb and village was changing its bylaws so you could build a, uh, a bomb shelter in your basement. So time moves, and the encroaching darkness, the darkness that, that was filled with wolves and tigers when we were cave people, uh, is always with us, taking on new shapes. Always new shapes, it always finds a new way to get at us. And the result is that in every generation, it's easiest to be a pessimist. It's very easy to look at what threatens us at any given time and take a close look and say, there's no way anybody can get out of this. And they've been saying that and writing it down since they wrote it on the pyramids. Oops. But if we stand back from history in our own race so that we look at a thousand years at a glance, we see fighting its way up from the mire and the ruck the essential humanity of our crazy race. We don't hold public hangings anymore. Not public hangings. We don't torture to the judicial order as a means of and if we do, we don't boast about it. Uh, I mean, it is, it is not an accepted order of things. The judge says, well, take him out and uh, stretch him at least five inches and then come back in and see what he says. Uh, we worry about uh, 
things that other people thought were outside their perimeter to worry about. The abuse of children, you see. The immorality of those who make our laws. We feel a response to the people in every part of the world, no matter what part they belong to. We feel a responsibility to them. It's the beginning of a responsibility that is going to grow and has been growing in a sense, at least since the Renaissance. And this is what the cycle is concerned with. Most of all in ourselves and in our children. Generally, we cultivate a conscience that is required at least to pay lip service to virtuous actions that nearly all the world now accepts as at least theoretically the right thing to do. You see, these things we have fought, we continue to fight, are merely the present shapes of these things that have always been with us. And the way to deal with them is the way we have always dealt with them down the centuries, and that is to deny the darkness. Refuse that it be believes that it can conquer the race in any shape, no matter what that shape is. Always say no, always push back. And by gosh, it will be gone. There'll be another mask there, just as horrible as before, but it's waiting. And eventually, eventually, we are going to work to the point where the individual has a total conscience a total sense of responsibility. What the cycle will do, what I will do, what has been my life work, and, and when I will, I will have to show when I have my 12 books done, is a development to a point where every one person is concerned about everything that affects the human race and dare not look anybody else in the eye and say, that's none of my business. This is the way the human race has survived and grown. This is the way it survives and grows now, whether we know it or not, even as we watch. And this is the way it's going to continue to survive. So I believe, so I've written, and I've used up your time and attention to tell you all this, but it's something I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you all.